Hey, this is John Gordon with the 21st Century Business Forum. And today my guest is Josh Lichtner. He's an incredible New York Times bestselling author, an innovation expert, a jazz guitarist, a venture capitalist, and a serial entrepreneur has built incredible businesses. Josh, it's great to have you with us. Truly a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. So Josh, you've written a number of books. What book do you think is most relevant right now based on what we're going through as a, as a country? Well, uh, books are kind of like kids. You hard, it's hard to like single out which one you like the best, <laughs> but um, I think there's two. So I wrote a book in 2014 called The Road to Reinvention. And certainly many of us are reinventing as the world hits the giant reset button and, and business relationships and such ha have changed dramatically. Um, but probably the one I would recommend is uh, my new book. It's, it's just coming out this year, Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. And the whole notion of it, John, is we flip the idea of innovation upside down. Instead of it being inaccessible and only for people wearing a lab coat or a hoodie and real you know, billionaires type, it's sort of like innovation for the rest of us, helping everyday people become everyday everyday innovators. And in these challenging times, I could think of no better skill to develop. I really love that title. One of my favorite titles I've ever heard, Big Little Breakthroughs. Can you talk about what that really means in terms of what is a big little breakthrough? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's so unfortunate because when we hear words like innovation, it can feel so overwhelming. And we think innovation only counts if it's a billion dollar idea or only maybe you have to be in a certain role to be innovative. And this democratizes creativity and innovation, allowing us to, instead of taking giant swing for the fences, highly risky bets, to cultivate a high volume of, da of daily small like micro innovations. So big little breakthroughs, funny enough, really drive our economy. According to a study by Harvard, 72% of gross domestic product of, of, of our economy is driven not by the ideas that capture the headlines, but by those little tweaks. And, and the good thing about little ideas is they're, they're accessible to us all. We can all be everyday innovators, regardless of our company or our role or our, our chosen profession. Can you give a few examples of some really cool big little breakthroughs? Yeah, I, oh man, dozens of them. It's, it's funny too, because in the book, I really don't talk about Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, nothing wrong with them. But but again, that feels so out of reach. And I love shining the light on, on the unknown stories that are much more fascinating that we can relate to. But uh, to, I'll give you one, our, our, our adventure begins on the streets of London. And imagine you're walking through downtown London and you look at and marveling at the architecture and the hustle and bustle, but then you look down and what do you see? Cigarette butts. So cigarette butts, it turns out, is the single biggest litter problem in central London. It's not only unsightly, but it's, it's, it's poisonous to animals and small children. It's terrible for the environment, et cetera. So all the programs that they've done to try to clean up cigarette litter basically have failed. Enter an everyday innovator named Trowin Resterick, a guy I interviewed for the book, who's not a famous person, which I just love. He's an everyday dude. Like He had a hard time getting through college, and he graduated and took a job and was just struggling to pay the bills but he loved the environment. He was very passionate about nature. And so we saw this problem and he took a different spin on it. His idea didn't require a billion dollars. It didn't require military grade technology or 16 PhDs. His idea is called the ballot bin. And a ballot bin, it's like this bright yellow metal box that's mounted eye level. And it's, it's bright yellow except for the front, which is glass. And at the top, it asks a two part question, like which is your favorite food, pizza or hamburgers? And beneath each of those choices, there's a little receptacle where you basically vote with your butts. You deposit your cigarette butts into this receptacle, which is like an ashtray, but you can see based on how many butts were placed in there, the tally of which, which is winning, hamburger or pizza. And all of a sudden you have this thing that's compelling and cheap and didn't take, like you and I could have figured that idea out ourselves. Here's what happened though. Cigarette litter, when these ballot bins are deployed is reduced by 80%. They're now live in 27 countries around the world. He's taken a real bite out of this problem by being an everyday innovator. It's a single big little breakthrough idea in action. And again, when I hear stuff like that, I get excited because I'm not a super genius, but I think, yeah, man, I could have probably come up with that. And that's what big little breakthroughs is all about. It's focusing on the ideas that each of us can deploy to drive meaningful change. It's a brilliant idea. Is the cardboard sleeve that we use for coffee uh, mugs, coffee cups at Starbucks and other coffee places. Is that a, a big little breakthrough? Totally. That's a big little breakthrough. I mean, they were having a problem. Everyone's double cupping and this is better for the environment. It saves money. I mean, just all around. So when, when you're a, a, an innovation nerd like me and you travel the globe and look under rocks trying to discover big little breakthroughs, it's so cool because again, innovation isn't only for one out of a billion people. Innovation is for us all. 
how can we begin to think differently as an innovator? Are some people more apt to be an innovator and have that innovator mindset? And if you're not born with that skill, can you develop it to think more innovatively? Oh man, I'm so glad you asked me that question. So innovation, it turns out, is much more like your weight than your height. So I'm 5'5 five five on a good day. And no matter how hard I try, I'm not gonna become a six footer. But my weight, I can control based on you know nutrition and exercise and such. Creativity is a learned skill. Now, some of us are born maybe with a little bit more propensity toward it, but it's not that one out of a thousand people are born creative and the rest of us have to suffer. Every single person, you, me, everyone in our respective teams can be innovative in their own ways. So like I play jazz guitar pretty well, I can't draw a stick figure if I tried. So for people listening, doesn't mean you have to change jobs. Maybe your, your superpower of creativity is the way you engage in conversation or the way you build a, a financial report. We can be creative in our own ways, but every single one of us can not only be creative, but learn to become more creative. As someone who is involved in the business world, how can we as business leaders get people to actually start thinking more innovatively? Like our people who work with us, our team, how can we get them to think different? Well, the first thing we need to do is create a safe environment. It turns out that fear, not natural talent, fear is the single biggest blocker of creative output. So if you tell people, hey, go be creative, but they, the unwritten thing is if you screw something up, you're fired, fear and creativity cannot coexist in the same room. So as a leader, I think we need to prioritize it and we need to accept a lot of bad ideas at times to, to, accept, to get to the good ones. So if we can create a safe environment, that's step number one, where all ideas are celebrated. The second thing is give people some techniques. The technique that most people use is called brainstorming, which is the most wildly out of date technique ever. First of all, it was like invented in the late 50s. Are you kidding me? Nothing's changed since the late 50s. But, but second of all, it's a perfectly designed exercise to yield mediocre ideas. Why? Again, because of fear. In other words, you and I are brainstorming. What are we going to share? Our crazy ideas? No, we share our wimpy, you know, puny, safe ideas because we don't want to look foolish. So my suggestion, I built a whole toolkit, actually, of more, much more modern uh, techniques, which I generally group in a, in a category called idea jamming instead of brainstorming. But with a, with a safe environment and with some fresh techniques, I've seen people who fold their arms and say they're grumpy and I, I can't be creative at all, become like wildly creative in a matter of minutes. So the good news again is it's absolutely a skill. While it might be lying dormant, we, we may need to remove some blockers with, with permission and some technique, we can really bring it to the surface. And I'm happy to share a technique if it's helpful. Yeah, I would, I would love that. So here's one that's really fun. Uh, and, and by the way, I have a whole bunch of techniques. Any of your leaders want to, or your listeners want to check it out. If you go to biglittlebreakthroughs.com, there's a button that says toolkit. Click right on toolkit and you can have instant access to all these. It's free, by the way. Just use the secret code innovate, which I put together for the show. So just use innovate, it's free. Anyway, one technique is really fun. It's called roll storming, roll storming. So roll storming is brainstorming in character. In other words, you're brainstorming as if you are somebody else. The way it works is you take on an actual real world challenge, but instead of being you, John, maybe you play the role of Steve Jobs. Here's the thing. Nobody's going to laugh at Steve for coming up with the big idea. They might laugh at Steve for coming up with a small one. So now you, AKA Steve, are liberated. You can say anything you want, no fear of retribution. So the way it works is each person chooses their own character. You could be uh, Hemingway. You could be Lady Gaga. You could be a villain or a hero. You fit fictional or not. And you literally pretend that you are that person during the brainstorm because all the, the, the worry is, is gone away. And just real quickly, I did this with a group of executives at Sony Japan one time. I met this guy. He was like the stiffest human being I've ever met. Dark suit, white shirt, tie, stiff as a board. Anyway, we got him roll storming as Yoda. And I got to tell you, I've never seen personal transformation like this. This dude's jacket's off, his tie's undone. He's like leaping around the room. And the whiteboards were instantly filled with ideas. I didn't teach him to be creative. He had that inside him all along, as do all of us. But he didn't have a technique. He didn't have permission. We gave him the tools. Boom. Creativity flew. That is so brilliant. I just, I love that story. Incredible. Can you talk about failure? How important is it to actually fail in the innovation process? Yeah, you know, it's funny. We, we've been we've been taught over the years that failure is a four letter word and mistakes are fatal. The truth is that that that's really part of the process of innovation. And I'm not saying that we should, you know, in some Pollyanna way, like, oh, let's aim for failure and go hug our failures and blah, blah, blah. But we got to recognize that adversity is part of life. If we're not stumbling, we're not going hard and fast enough. 
one of the mindsets that I cover in the book is a, it's a principle I call fall seven times, stand eight, which is a phrase I borrowed from a Zen proverb. It's not just dogged persistence though. It's the fusion of creativity and, and, and resilience. In other words, you know you're gonna, get, you're gonna stumble at times, but how do you get back in the fight with more creativity? One thing that I wrote about, which is pretty fun, um, there's a museum in Sweden called the Museum of Failure. And it's, it's designed to showcase the role that failures play in the creative process. And they've got these really funny examples. There's one, uh, for example, um, we all drink flavored and vitamin enhanced water. So somebody thought, oh, I'm sure our pets would want that. So they created this, like, this disgusting brown liquid. One, one is like crispy beef flavor and tangy fish flavor for dogs and cats. And they thought, oh, why wouldn't cut people want to buy this stuff for their pets? Of course, nobody did. It was a terrible failure. And But again, we can chuckle at somebody else's failures, but we feel ashamed at our own. So my encouragement to everybody is if you want to get to some good ideas, you have to tolerate the bad ones along the way. It's just part of the process. So you're the number one speak on innovation. What drives you to speak on this? And I can just tell you're so passionate about it. Where does that come from? Thanks for saying that. You know, I, I really say this with, with great humility. For me, it's not about feeling good on stage. Hello, I love meeting cool people. It's none of that. It's not about money. It's about impact. I really feel, and I know this sounds like a postcard man, but I just believe this in my soul. I feel like I'm on this mission to help everyday people become everyday innovators. I literally hope they write that on my tombstone. And, and the reason I feel that way so strongly is I believe, and, and the research, by the way, uh, backs it up, that human beings, if you look at us as a society around the world, have huge amounts of dormant creative capacity inside of us. And if we can unlock just a little bit, I'm not even talking about like a thousand percent upgrade, but if we had just a 5% upgrade, think about what that would do in our world. And, and a 5% creativity upgrade can mean the difference in better outcomes in, in education and healthcare and environment and on and on and on. And so I believe knowing that all these humans are walking around, including me, with, 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 with extra capacity that we can bring to the surface, it would be a tragedy if I didn't run around the world helping people extract it. And, and I've just seen it. I've seen people that, that insist they're not creative because their third grade teacher told them they couldn't draw very well. And all of a sudden we, we put them in the right environment and we change their mindset and they're wildly creative. And, and if I can help a lot of people become more creative, I, I feel like it's a life worth living. The big word this year has been pivot or adapt in terms of 2020 based on what we've been through with COVID. Now, as we move with 2021, how are you seeing people adapt? What kind of innovations are you seeing? What's inspired you during this time? Well, the human spirit of of resiliency and and uh, that that's been you know deeply moving, and I, I certainly don't mean to be glib. You know, well, there's great innovations. I know as a world, we've we've suffered a lot of setbacks as well. Um, but but that being said, you know, the, the old saying that invention. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, people are inventing all kinds of new approaches. And some of them are big, some of them make headlines, but more of them are these big little breakthroughs. You know, we're seeing people reimagine the way that they go to market with their product or service or, or change their staffing model or, or shift the way they set up the office. And to me, those, those are just inspiring because all of us can, can get our arms around them. You know, the thing that, that's also encouraging me is, is as the world hits this giant reset button, there's a real opportunity. Maybe a customer was loyal to a particular business for 30 years in a row because the world was fundamentally the same, but now that loyalty is up for grabs because the world is different. So especially for the underdogs, the smaller businesses, those that are they're trying to make their mark on the world and they're up against the against the, the entrenched incumbents. There's a real opportunity for, 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 for we smaller folk to, to make our mark now because all bets are off to a degree. So when you go work with, with a company, what's that process look like? Just take us through a, a sort of an overview. Well, it depends on on, on the uh, the objective, obviously. You know, oftentimes I'm brought in at a company event or an association event, and you know, sort of a mix. To the the objective is to kind of you know inspire folks to to fire them up, but also to give them some practical tools that they can use in the months and years to come. And so, if there's a keynote, you know, I'm usually I've never given the same keynote twice, even though I've delivered over a thousand keynotes around the world. But I really kind of tap into this huge library of, of stories, and I stitch together a, a narrative that I think will be impactful to to, to that specific audience. If I'm going in at a deeper level though, we really try to do either one of two things. Either it's a particular challenge we're taking on. Maybe they're trying to bring a new product to market or maybe they're just trying to you know, grow sales in Toledo or whatever their core objective is. That's one, one approach where we go in and, and sort of learn at the same time we're solving the problem together. 
The other times we're, we're brought in, my team and I, is, is they, the company recognizes that they want to have sort of an overall upgrade. They say, I want to build a culture of innovation. I want to make sure that every one of my people is bringing innovation to the game every day. And in that case, we help them really examine the rituals and rewards and, and, and what's defining their cultural attributes and, and embed a deep sense of ongoing creativity as, as, a, as a usable asset. Think about this. If you had an oil well in your backyard, I'm pretty sure you're going to like go tap it. You're not just going to say, yeah, yeah, maybe another day. I mean, there's value. You're going to go make it happen. Well, in the same way, there's most organizations have this untapped asset, which by the way, is free and renewable and doesn't hurt the environment, you know? And so, so I, we kind of go in there and help them build systems and processes to extract that value. That's so powerful. Steve Case, who founded AOL, he said about big little breakthroughs, he said it provides a clear path to help you build an army of everyday innovators and turn ideas into action. How do we turn ideas into actions and innovations into real world results? Uh, so the first step is to de-risk the creative process. You know, right now, you know the scales of justice? When you think about an idea, here's what generally happens. We think that doing nothing is really safe and we think that trying the idea is really risky. So what do we do? We do nothing. So first thing we gotta do is shine a bright flashlight on the real risk of standing still. And that's much bigger than people think. You know, go, go talk to the folks who are at Pan Am Airlines or Oldsmobile and say, how did standing still work out so well for you? So once we recognize that there, there's an inherent risk in doing nothing, then we have to de-risk trying something. And the way to do that is embracing an experimentation mindset. Instead of these wild swing for the fence approaches, try to take ideas and we should always be experimenting. Hopefully every person in an organization is running three or four concurrent experiments all the time. And, and they're little, so, so fix time, fix money experiments. Like, hey, I've got this idea. Could I try it for 20 bucks with a, with a little bit of Play-Doh? And so can you build a, a really rudimentary low fidelity prototype? Can you get it started? Can you test it with one customer on one Tuesday afternoon at one o'clock? And so over time, you're just always running experiments, recognizing that many will fail, which is fine. Discard them quickly, no harm done. And then the ones that seem to show promise, then you double the size of the experiment and double that again. So we can bring ideas into action, not by becoming overly overnight, you know, courageous. It's rather by taking a very systematic approach. Think about this real quick. Think about how a drug discovery comes to life. So thank God the, the folks at, at, at Pfizer and Moderna, they brought this COVID relief to life very quickly. It wasn't like some guy had an idea, ran down the hall and says, Eureka, I've got it. Let's go print a billion copies of this vaccine. Of course not. That would be ludicrous. What happens? They get in a safe environment in a lab. They test a whole bunch of stuff. They might have tested a thousand ideas. 998 of them failed. Two seemed to show some promise. They doubled down on those experiments. And over time, through tweaking and, ad and adapting in a safe environment, they were able to enjoy tre tremendous results. When you think of innovation like that, when you demystify it, when it doesn't seem so much like you know, magic, it, it seems more like science, that's when we can bring ideas to life. What's the difference in the innovation and creative process from tweaking and creating from scratch? You know, tweaking is often frowned upon, like it's the ugly stepchild of, you know, of, of innovation. And I actually don't think of it that way at all. When you think of an idea, and let's say you had the idea to create, oh, I don't know, the perfect hard boiled egg, and you're gonna market them on QVC or something. So there's first the initial idea, and that's important. There's nothing wrong with that. But really just the idea, most ideas that come to life are deeply flawed. In other words, it might be directionally interesting, but you haven't worked out all the kinks. So really, if you, if you dissect by the time you had this idea till the time you sold 11 mil, million units on, on QBC, there's probably 100 or 1,000 other ideas along the way. Each of those are equally valuable. So instead of saying initial ideas are really valuable and after that, it's just mindless execution, I try to think of it as a string of ideas. So yeah, there's, you have to start with something, but then that next idea, do you make it in, in plastic or metal? What's the next idea? What's the next idea after that? And so it's a series of ideas that are important in bringing an idea truly to its full potential. Which by the way, again, gets back to li big little breakthroughs. If you're not the person that generates an initial idea, it doesn't mean you just have to be a mindless execution person. Like you have the opportunity at every step of the way to add your creativity. Your creative approach might be the way you quality do quality assurance. It might be the way you package it or bring it to life or, or, or share the instructions so consumers know how to use it. So my only point is that, well, well, initial ideas are important. So are all the ones that follow along. And let's not, let's not shun those, let's celebrate them. Because they're all part of the process, right? They're all part of the process. And, and, and one without, I mean, they're all important. So, so we, 
I think that that often is the case where people put so much emphasis on an initial idea and so little emphasis on all the little creative adjustments that need to happen for it to come to life. Let's stop judging those. You know, let, let's just celebrate them all because they're all equally important. What do you hope that big little breakthroughs does for the, the reader? I hope it gives them the tools and mindsets that first of all, they recognize that, hey, I can be a, an innovative person. And I know that sounds like not a big thing, but a lot of people don't feel that way. A lot of people say it's outside of my grasp. I'm not creative. They've got a lot of myths and barriers holding them back. So first I want people to say, you know what? This is for me. Like this is within my grasp. The outcomes that I seek in my life, whether they're professional or personal or community can, can be achieved with, with more creativity. And then they say, I got this, like I can do it. From there, I think the book really shares the specific techniques and mindsets. It gives a step-by-step -step game plan on how to become an everyday innovator, how to give yourself a creativity upgrade, and ultimately how to put those principles to use to drive the outcomes that you seek. Do you think that social media and distractions keep us from our big little breakthroughs? They keep us from being creative. It seems like we have more distractions than ever. How important is it to find time to actually reflect, to think, to actually be creative. Well, I do think that social media can be distracting. I also think it can create unrealistic expectations because I might post some idea, hey, look at this thing I invented. And it looks like I did it when I was in the shower. And by the time I dried off, it was perfect. But the truth is there's a lot of work that went into that. Or we see people with body images that have been Photoshopped and we get mad at ourselves that we don't match up. So I, I think it creates an unrealistic uh, standard and, and we, we end up being upset with ourselves that we can't live up to it. But, but, but your question, the root of it is around distraction. You know, most of us spend time heads down and we're cranking away on, on, on deliverables to do items, but we rarely get time to be heads up. And I do think it's an important part of the creative process to have time that might feel frivolous at first, but where you can really let your mind go. Uh, I, I have often challenged people to take a 5% challenge, a 5% like heads up challenge. If you think about a 40 hour work week, and I know most of us work more than 40, but you know, if it's just 40, 5% is two hours, two hours a week. If you took 5% for just one month, that's it. So I'm going to take a fixed experiment, one month, two hours a week. And you schedule that time, just like you'd schedule an important meeting. It can't be, can't be moved. And in that time, instead of just cranking out deliverables, you have let let your mind wander a little bit. You explore the possibilities, you reflect, you, you think about the future. And here's what's happened. I've given this challenge to thousands of people around the world. First thing I hear back is a 0% drop in productivity, zero. Magically, 40 hours of work, gets smushed into 38 hours, nobody misses a beat. But then I hear people say, you know, the first week I felt frivolous. I felt like I was like cheating on my spouse or something. I felt so guilty. But by the end of that 30 days, they, they recognized that was the most important, most productive two hours of their week. And many people have, have embraced that philosophy for, for years thereafter. And, and the thing is this, human creativity, it's a gift to us because there are very few things in life that are as intrinsically rewarding. Not to mention it can be a gift for your organization. So kind of like everybody wins here. It's a fun thing. It's, it's easy to try. Give it a shot. 5% 30 days. Such a great idea. I think we should all do that. I take walks each day and that's where I get ideas. That's where I've written most of the books I've written in my head, actually, on those walks. For you, where do you get your best ideas and when? Well, I wrote about this in the book. I borrowed a technique from my friend, Neil Pasrico, who's a wonderful author who lives in Toronto. And he said, you know, think about your ordinary work week. It's, it's a smattering of, of meetings and, and, and then sometimes you have some time to think, but because it's all, all you know, mixed together, you know, how do you generate your best idea when you have a conference call in 11 minutes? So what he did is he said, I'm going to reorganize my calendar. He smushed all of his meetings and, and important tasks into four days each week. He didn't work any extra hours, but then he kept one, one day protected. He calls it an untouchable day. And that gives him the, the creative freedom. He basically unplugs from social media, turns his email off, turns his phone off, only his spouse knows how to reach him. And that's his day to be creative. And so I borrowed this technique from him about a year and a half ago. And it's been the single biggest boost to my productivity in, in, in a decade or more. So once, once a week, I take one day, depending on the week, it might vary the day, where I just like lock myself in the room and go deep on creativity. And that really helps. And then the only other thing I'd say is for me personally, I get inspired when I have a guitar in my hand because that's my muse. But I think that each of us can connect to whatever our muse might be. Yours might be walking, as you mentioned, or lacrosse, of course. Um, other people might be reading poetry or doing a rap interpretive dance, who knows, but whatever inspires you, find a way to inject that into your process. And I do think your creativity will elevate. You're a jazz guitarist. I've always been fascinated by musicians and how they come together to create 
music, create a song, different people come together, different talents, and the creative process eventually produces this song. Can you apply that from a music standpoint, a creative standpoint to also everyday life? Do you see the similarities between the two? I really do, actually. And I've written about this extensively. So I play jazz, as, as I mentioned, and jazz is this art form. It's, it's basically spontaneous innovation. Only 1% of the notes are on the written page and the rest you have to make up as you go. So if I'm playing in a jazz club and I play the same song for 100 days in a row, every night it's different. And so as a result, it's, it's much more kind of like a conversation. Like you and I didn't script our conversation. We're kind of riffing off of each other. That's what, that's what jazz is very much like. But here's what I would argue. It, it looks on the surface that jazz musicians are these wildly creative people because they just invent as they go in real time. Truth is that there's some structure, just like the techniques we were talking about. But the environment itself, I would argue, drives more creative output than anything else. Here's the thing. When I'm playing jazz with a, with a group of professionals, if I play it safe, if I just play what I already know, I kind of get lapped off the stage. But if I take a risk, if I, if I play a clunker, I just play it twice more and call it art. Everything is cool. So, so basically <laughs> what I'm saying is that the, the, the culture of a jazz combo encourages people to take responsible risks. It's a, it's a safe environment where people can go out on a limb and express their creative abilities. If we think of our organizations, just like that jazz combo, if, if, if your organization is more like a classical music thing where, where there's a, an instructor hold, hanging with a ruler every time someone makes a mistake and whacks you on the knuckles, nobody's gonna take a creative risk. So if we think of our, 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 our companies, our organizations more like a jazz combo where it's fluid and it, it's spontaneous and, and, and there is risk taking inappropriate ways and people do have to course correct when they make a mistake but that's all part of the art that's what i think will lead our companies to to a brighter future creating a culture of of innovation that is so good what a great concept what you're talking about here thank you and and, and again I, I there's one myth i wanted to spell because i talk to people all the time and they're like oh i'm just not a creative person and when i hear that my heart breaks because you know I, i've spent my life developing creative skills but i'm no more inherently creative than you or anybody else is we all and, and again the research is so clear we have the hardware the brain chemistry that you and i have is nearly identical to that of paul mccartney and Leonardo and da vinci and picasso and we, we, we have the ability, if you can learn language, if you can learn to swing a tennis racket, you can learn to be creative. And so I really hope that people walk away thinking for a second, instead of themselves like, gee, that's not me, saying, wait a minute, maybe it could be me. Maybe I could learn to develop some creative skills. Maybe I could improve on this ability and in turn enjoy spectacular results. You said in Big Little Breakthroughs, you have mindsets that people could develop to actually have more success. Right now we have people who are struggling with their mindset. There's a lot of fear, anxiety negativity. A lot of people are really going through a tough time. What's a mindset? What's one mindset that you actually teach that you would like to share with people to help encourage them during this time as they move forward? Yeah. So it, in, in the research, and I spent over a thousand hours in research and interviews for the book, I interviewed CEOs, billionaires, celebrity entrepreneurs, people who've won Grammy awards. I mean, really cool, successful people. But what I discovered across this wide range of people in different geographies and industries and genders and such is, is, is some common mindsets. And so in the book, I cover the eight, I call them core obsessions of everyday innovators. And, and the nice thing is that these are things that are within the grasp of all of us. They, you, you don't have to have fancy degrees or be from a certain place on the planet. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of them real quick. Uh, one of them is start before you're ready. And the notion behind that is instead of waiting for a directive or permission or till everything in your business plan is perfect, innovators of all shapes and sizes, big or small projects, just get going. And then they figure it out as they go. They, they're, they're unwilling to just wait till conditions are perfect, but rather they just take the initiative and, and find a way forward. A couple other more fun ones. One of them uh, is called Don't Forget the Dinner Mint. The notion there is uh, creative people of all, again, all shapes and sizes, right before shipping a piece of work, whether your work is writing or, or, or crafting or whatever your work might be, writing a legal brief, I don't know. They, they say, wait a minute, is there something that I could add to this? Is there a little extra creative flourish that could be, make the work product transcendent? And so the notion is that a little 5% extra that you could add to, to whatever it is that you do, that 5% extra creativity might, might deliver a 500% difference in, in the output. And then one last one that I'll just share real quickly because I just happen to love it. Uh, it's called use every drop of toothpaste. And the notion there, uh, John, is around being scrappy and resourceful. The biggest objection most people have is I don't have the fill in the blank. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I don't have the raw materials. I don't have the team members. And, and instead of 
looking at those lack of external resources as an obstacle, use every drop of toothpaste is more around saying, what can I do? How can I be resourceful? How can I use ingenuity instead of external resources? And just to be clear, if the amount of resources that you had equaled the amount of creativity that you had, the federal government would be the most creative organization on the planet and startups would be the least creative organization. And we know, of course, the opposite is true. That is so brilliant because I meet people all the time that complain, I can't sell, I don't have this, I don't have that. Salespeople often complain about that instead of focusing on what they do have, what they can sell from. And so you're saying, hey, find that creativity within you to sell with what you have or to use what you have to be successful, right? Yeah, one of my favorite superheroes of all time had no powers. He didn't have x-ray vision, couldn't fly. Maybe you remember MacGyver. And so MacGyver was this guy, he didn't even carry a gun, he carried a <laughs> roll of duct tape, but he was always able to get out of a jam and his his power was being resourceful. And that's kind of what we talk about in the book is not not focusing on what you what you lack, but more about what you have. So last question, we love to give takeaways here and action steps at the 21st century business forum. What are three takeaways right now for people, entrepreneurs, business leader, businesses as they move forward? Just three actionable tips that we can take to get better, to innovate more. I know you've shared a lot already and we really appreciate all the wisdom and insights you've shared, but can you give us some tips for 2021 to be our best? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I think that we um, try, try not to, there's a great saying, it's a quote from Seneca, which is don't stumble on something behind you. And I think that even though many of us have really struggled through through COVID, and I say that with great respect, but I think we need to move forward with confidence and and, and be unapologetic. Uh, now is our time to, to really go for it. And if we sort of limp into the future, I worry that's not gonna be our, our best ally. Uh, the second thing I would say is try to make daily creativity a habit, even if it's five minutes a day. You know, when I was learning to play music, even if I had a killer guitar lesson, if I didn't practice every day, I'd forget what I learned. And so, Skills are developed through, through small bites of daily practice, more so than one lightning bolt of inspiration. So just like you'd practice anything else, just a little bit of practice. Try just little teeny things. Like maybe you wear your watch on the opposite hand one day, or you brush your teeth with the opposite hand. Or maybe when you go to order your next pizza, you ask for the pepperoni under the cheese instead of on top. So, so go for things that are easy and safe, but, but just build a daily habit of it. And what you'll in turn see is real momentum. And finally, if you are ready to kind of start before you're ready, I did want to offer up uh, biglittlebreakthroughs.com. It's not a sales pitch. There's, uh, there's no like course you can buy or anything, but there's a whole bunch of tools. There's a free assessment to see how you're doing now and, and where the holes might be. There's a whole bunch of brainstorming techniques and all kinds of other fun stuff. And again, it's not, I'm not saying that for commercial gain. I'm saying it because I think it can help. So if, if you get a chance, check it out, biglittlebreakthroughs.com. It can help. And I've been to that website. I've, I've seen your tools and they're really helpful. And I love that you give so much away and I can see why you are a New York Times bestselling author. I can see why your books are like hotcakes and I can see why you're the number one speaker on innovation in this country. Josh, appreciate you so much, the information that you shared and just your desire to help people. I know that you're making so many of us better and I know I got better from this interview. Thank you so much. Well, John, thank you. Thank you for your incredible body of work and for hosting me today. It's truly an honor to be with you and I'm, I'm a big fan of yours. So thanks again for, for the opportunity. Now let me thank our sponsors and each of you for joining us today. Join me next month. My guest will be Steve Cannon. I'll see you then.